First, we drove to the west, all the way from Tampa, Florida to Oceanside, California. We did stop by Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and to see the Marfa Lights in the Texan desert. El Paso, Texas, touristy Tombstone, Arizona. We spent a few days among thousands of nomads and snowbirds in Quartzsite, then forgotten California, mainly Slab City, the Imperial Sand Dunes, and Bombay Beach. We stayed at the Coachella Valley and finally reached the Pacific Ocean. Today, we begin the trek back east. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. Yeah. Well, this is where we left off as I witnessed the sunset over the Pacific Ocean, bidding farewell to the West Coast. There goes the train again, with the annoying fake whistle. I'm leaving Del Mar, and I have a pretty long drive ahead of me, going towards the campground. Should be over two hours for sure. Well, at least this is the last uh, gas uh, that I will pay at over three dollars, three sixty-nine here. Well, there's something you don't see every day. That's all the traffic behind me on the freeway. And check out the moon. I'll be honest, it looked amazing in person. The video just doesn't do it justice. There, that's more like it. And this is the Coachella Valley Overlook. Seems to be very popular with young people who come and park to look at the moon, I guess. Let's make this stew. And the first step is to brown the meat, even burn it a little, seal those juices in. I went to Aldi and bought some beer, so we're going to bathe it in IPA to enhance the flavor. Okay, let's pour a second IPA and we're going to let that simmer for a while. Mmm, it is looking so good. Then we're gonna dice some onions and put them in, uh, smash some garlic and chop it as well. Ideally, I would have done the garlic and the onions separate, but this is a one-pot meal today. Now some bell peppers, dice them up, and some celery as well, a, a bit of tomato sauce, and I also added mushrooms, carrots, olives, cumin, oregano, smoked paprika, and a bit of shirasha for flavor, but I'm so tired, I'm just going to eat and go to sleep. Well, good morning from La Quinta, California. Today... We begin our trek back east. Oh well, check out the moonset. Nice view, huh? I do believe that is the Salton Sea in the distance. And down here, well, that is the campground, of course.
is not good. Got it flat. Well, this is the first real setback of the whole trip. And after almost three weeks, that's not bad at all, actually. I get to use my trail aid tire changing ramp. Hear that water slushing in my gray water tank? Actually, could be the black, too. I'm almost overdue for a visit to the dump station. Oh, wait. I'm supposed to loosen the lug nuts first. I'm such an amateur. Luckily, I have a spare in decent shape. Now all we need is a little air and off we go to the nearest tire shop. Everything was going so smooth. Well, anyways, the good news is that I think this tire is salvageable. It's just a nail. Check it out. I think that's all there is to it. So they might be able to patch it and then uh, I'll get a new tire in Phoenix. Because nobody has trailer tires in this town. I'll use that one for now and then I'll use that one as a spare. That's the plan anyways. Well, as I said, before we leave, a trip to the dump station is in order. I mean, I'm going to an RV park in Phoenix, but I, we're going to be going through some mountains, so I want to be as lightweight as possible. I've settled on a tire shop here in nearby Indio, California, called El Valle. Hopefully I can get a plug on my flat tire and I'll just take it easy on the way to Phoenix. Well, this part is a pretty nice park. Okay, here I am. I got the, the tires uh, patched up here at El Valle Automotive. Very nice uh, folks. So, um, these tires apparently are very hard to get, but I'm just gonna go to Phoenix like this and uh, hopefully. Yes, uh, Phoenix is actually a lot more RV friendly, so I am sure I'll be able to find some tires there. Okay, let's stop it off one last time at California Prices. I figured might as well get something to eat. They have a Popeyes here. This is the Coachella Travel Center. It's a TA. Well, I love fried chicken. Well, I haven't had Popeyes in a very long time. Well, it is time to get on the road again. We are approaching Blythe, and there's the California inspection station where they will surely confiscate any citrus coming from Arizona. And as we cross the river, we're going to Arizona. Look how pretty. Arizona state line. Welcome to Arizona. Thank you. Descending upon Guard 
inside. All these uh, gas stations here in Quartzsite are always super busy. and wash where I stayed a couple of days ago although it feels like a long time Very straight, I-10 in this area. And check out the power line. It almost looks like a suspension bridge. Well, it is really not that far, but somehow it has felt endless. I am staying in Apache Junction, which is east of Mesa, which is east of Phoenix, which means I basically have to drive through the entire metropolitan area, even through the city. Apparently, the GPS thought this was a better idea than braving it on the interstate. I don't know. <laughs> In my RV, yeah, I'm riding, riding, riding. I'm riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Because I'm free. In my RV, yeah. Well, here I am, tired, arriving at the Apache Junction KOA, where I'm going to spend a couple of nights. here uh, yesterday as you saw right at sunset I am in uh, Apache uh, Junction uh, Arizona which is uh, east of uh, uh, Phoenix and I thought it would be a lot closer to Phoenix but it's not it's like an hour drive but anyways uh, I am uh, here and I've been busy all morning and, uh, and I didn't take the camera but I did an oil change on the on old Kia and I, I bought a, a, a new tire let me show you as you saw, I got a flat tire uh, back in California, probably in Slab City. I, I got that nail armor. And here I've got a brand new tire that I'm going to install before I leave. And, um, I did an oil change. They, they added a power steering fluid because of that noise that it was having. And uh, I did groceries. I, I, I bought an extra hard drive because uh, I'm going to need it with all the footage that I've been taking. So, um, well, that's it. Uh, now I'm going to start exploring Apache Junction, Mesa, and eventually Phoenix. Uh, well, greetings from the Mesa Apache Junction KOA, 
Not too bad as far as KOAs go, although a little pricey at about $47 per night. And the staff? Uh, well, this is what happened. They closed the laundry on me five minutes before 9 p.m. with my clothes in the dryer. <laughs> I was not a happy camper, and I called her 24-hour line, and the same grumpy lady who took me to my site last night begrudgedly opened the door so I could take my clothes. Anyway, on to nicer things. I am going to drive a little to the east here towards Superstition Mountain. There are a couple of attractions in the area. This here is Superstition Mountain or Lost Dutchman Museum and as soon as you step out of the car it almost feels like you've stepped into a western movie. I mean, take out the picnic tables and the golf cart, uh, you see what I mean? Let's go in. Here's uh, the gift shop. And uh, the museum, it is five dollars to see it, uh, but I'd rather explore the outside first. Very cool to see all these species of cacti. There's the chapel. Actually, before going into the chapel, let me check out this stagecoach uh, right here. Uh, I guess this was the main mode of transportation in these parts during the Wild West days. Hmm, it has stairs. Maybe I should step inside. Well, this is not very big in here. Just big enough for four people, maybe, and not very comfortable. It's pretty cool. Now let's see the Elvis Chapel, which was moved here piece by piece from the Apache Land Movie Ranch. It was built actually for the Elvis Presley Western Charo. Fun fact, it was the only Elvis movie in which he did not sing on screen. He only did it during the opening credits. Inside, it almost feels like a shrine to the king. There is this sculpture, guitar in hand, at the main altar. They have a bunch of movie posters and memorabilia and photos of Elvis movies and other movies as well. Apparently, a bunch of Western movies were filmed here in this area, including uh, the Charo movie by Elvis Presley. Okay, let's see what else they have here. Some of these uh, sets, like the church and the barn, were moved here from the Apache Land movie set in nearby Gold Canyon after the fire of 2004, which almost destroyed the whole set. And there's the telegraph machine. These are interesting rules. You may pause the video if you want uh, to see them. Mesa 21, Tortilla Flat 11, Goldfield 1, Globally 1, this are like where you bought the tickets for the stagecoach. There's the barber and dentist and everything. All in one. The saguaro cacti and this mountain certainly epitomize the image of the Wild West we have through the movies. There's the barn brought from Apache Land. Guard. And the outhouse, of course. All this old equipment here. And they have a, a blacksmith shop. Southwest. And that's a pretty cool train set, but I believe there's a much larger one towards the back. Let's go out, check the rest of the trains. 
Yep, I think I am definitely into model trains, and this one is one of the better ones I've seen. It basically depicts the role that the railroad played in the development of Arizona, particularly for commerce. section of this set depicts a different scenario from Native American settlements to frontier towns. Well, this is supposed to be a cattle ranch. Such exquisite detail. different types of mines, like silver mines and gold mines. Well, that was the Superstition Mountain Museum, definitely a pretty neat place to visit. Well, here we are, the Goldfield Ghost Town. Goldfield established in 1893. Yep, the original Goldfield was established as a gold mining town, although I've learned this is all recreation. Check out the train station first. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do the train ride first and, and then we'll explore the town. Looks really nice. There's uh, this narrow gauge railroad that goes around the town. It is a 20 minute ride for 9 bucks, so let's go inside I can get the train ticket here at the gift shop, which is pretty nice, you know, they have the usual trinkets and knickknacks. There is one noisy locomotive. Alright, all aboard! <laughs> Well, if anything, we'll get an overview, a lay of the land, if you will. The audio system is really bad, barely intelligible, so I will narrate a little bit here. I think what I gathered is that this saguaro cactus here is 75 years old, which is pretty young actually. Okay, a little bit of history. The original gold field only lasted five years before it started to die down when the gold vein played out. After that, it survived on and off until around 1926. By the way, that's of course Superstition Mountain, which the Apache considered haunted and sacred at the same time. Check out all the cacti, well, we'll see many more of those. Is everybody enjoying our winter? Small peak sticking up there, coming to a point. I think that's the rock formation that they call the Witch's Hat. It is an amazing looking mountain, isn't it? Very iconic. This is the entrance to a mine, originally with a steam powered winch. Small steam and here we have some rusting, abandoned mining equipment.
we continue moving. Yeah, very slowly. Well, as I was saying, the town pretty much died in 1926. Then, in 1966, uh, this guy Bob's shoes uh, came to Superstition Mountain and fell in love with the area. You know, he wanted to own his own ghost town. And when he found Goldfield, well, there wasn't much there left. So he and his wife, they bought this land here in 1984 where the Goldfield Mill was and they rebuilt the town little by little. I don't know if this actually looks anything like the original Goldfield, and my guess is probably not, but it sure looks cool. Ooh, and there's an RV park. That was about 45 cents a minute, and I don't know if it was worth it for the for the information or the entertainment value of it, but it was a nice overview to just go around the whole town and get a little bit of the history. The town is, of course, mostly shops, and now that I know that it is reconstructed, I get more of a tourist trap feel, but still, the setting is so picturesque. It almost makes it feel, in my mind, more authentic, if that makes sense. The town certainly fits the image about the Wild West that Hollywood has planted in our collective consciousness. They have, of course, one of these places where they will take old-time photos of you in costume. Sage. Maybe I'll go to the saloon. Okay, there we go, ghost town information. Well, this is falling, so this is this must be authentic. It's a museum and it didn't look all that inviting. You know what looks inviting right now? It's the saloon. Oh, the gunfights are only Saturday and Sunday. Well, maybe I'll come back. This is a Goldfield Jail. It's inside. You know what? One thing for certain, it looks a lot more authentic than Tombstone, for sure. Yep, but looks can be deceiving. Let's get a drink. that stagecoach in the back might be one of the few authentic things here it was brought from tombstone and restored very cool bar regardless Nice, they have an outside patio with a view of the mountain. And live music. Very cool place. 
this year. Not that bad. Let me explore the rest of the time. But definitely very cool place and that bartender is a trip. I later found out that that bartender was Bob Shoes himself, the founder, owner and mayor of Goldfield. And there's the bordello that we'll visit later. There's the church on the mount. Let's go inside. Okay, let's check this out. Yes, Cowboy Commandments. Pause the video for a laugh, actually. Well, this is it. The church. The chandeliers are made from old wagon wheels. And they do have service on Sundays at 11 a.m. There goes our train. And here's the Eagle Eye Shooting Gallery. Here's one of the many shops, this one selling wind chimes. And um, here's another one on the ground floor, below the bordello. Let's go up the spiral staircase and check out that bordello that I was telling you about. Very nice view from the top. And I just love the landscape in this part of Arizona with all the saguaro cacti. And I just love this little town even if it is fake or recreated. Okay, let's go in. I get pretty much a private tour from this very knowledgeable former employee. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so it started about a quarter mile up the road up there. There was about a town of about a thousand people up there. Okay, this part of the town is where your miners worked, where your miners lived. They lived in tents saw surrounding here. We had three saloons, we had one brothel, we had um, three cribs, and then we had various other things. So it was about 25 structures here. There was one decent woman to every 50 men. And what they didn't spend on their tent and their food, they would come and join our hurdy-gurdy girls here. Now, if a gentleman wanted something a little bit different and a little bit, he had money, he would talk to the bartender and he'd be introduced to one of these girls up here. These okay. are brothel girls. Okay, now, the brothel girls, as you can see, were a lot cleaner, but one thing about the brothel girls, they were literate. They could read and write. And please join the room in there, take your camera in there. Okay. That's supposed to be the highly, um, uh, kind of a haunted room, if you want to say. Okay. Um, you can see the size of Brazil there, sir. Most of the women were about 5'5 five five and weighed over 200 pounds. Uh, the madam mm -hmm. liked the women big, because... Uh, if they were big, they probably were not diseased. Okay, this is our madame's room. This would be her beautiful room right here. She mm -hmm. did allow the miners to come in and have a bath there, but uh, oh, this is cool. you know they, that's pretty much all they could afford in here. Mm -hmm. Look how many bodies they're going to pull out of that thing today. Every time they get out that thing out there, they're pulling bodies out of it. Oh, yeah? There's a graveyard down there. So the whole place is a graveyard. Every time they dig something, they can find bodies. So the women would, would use copper or another type of a coin for contraception. Another jar would be put in their room and when the jar was full, all the madam would get all the jars together and uh, she would escort, she would get in her carriage and take it up to the town up there and that's what we call dirty money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me tell you about a shot glass. Uh, okay. This one... This wouldn't happen up here, but it would happen in one of your saloons across the street up there. Gentleman miner would walk in. I don't have any money. I spent it all with the girls. Okay, what do you got? My bullets. So the bartender would line it up there, and he'd probably get his cheapest whiskey that he had down there, or watered-down whiskey. He'd line it up to here and line it up to here. Give him two cents for this bullet, five cents for this bullet. And if he wasn't in need of this for his 45, he'd sell this for about 10 to 12 cents. So that's for a shot for a bullet. That's where a shot glass comes from. Oh, from the Western days, that is. Wow, I did. Right. Yeah. So anyway, any questions? No, no. This Please look around. We got some stuff from Tombstone. These are original badges from Tombstone. So oh, really? that your camera would like that. This, of course, is the abbreviated version of the tour. If you want to see the whole thing, the whole 10 minutes, I'll put a link to that video. Uncut somewhere. Well, that was really cool. That was a cool tour here of the, of the old brothel. Well, let's continue exploring.
there's the outhouse and this is where they do the mine tours and let you do gold panning and all that. It is all very picturesque, but we must go on. Well, this was a lot of fun here visiting the, the gold field, the uh, ghost town. Uh, check out that mountain, check out this, it's, it's gorgeous. This here is the state park. Maybe I'll stay here next time. As the day slowly comes to an end. There's our favorite mountain once again. Well, let's drive around the neighborhood. We've got some pretty nice houses here as we approach Superstition Mountain. I wanted to eat here at the Dutchman's hideout, but it is closed. Check that out. That view in your backyard? Woo. Well, enough snooping around this fancy neighborhood. Let's return to our campground in Apache Junction. And uh, at some point we'll make it to Phoenix, right? Decided to go to Phoenix. So, I was doing some research back at the campground, you know, the usual top 10 things to do in Phoenix and such, and this came up, First Fridays, and guess what, today is the first Friday of the month. It is officially called First Fridays Art Walk, and thousands of people take over downtown, and there's art and music, food, street performers, let's check it out. to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ alone. As you probably know, whenever there is sin, you will find someone preaching the gospel. That's just the way it is. Yes, lots of people here. There's someone playing the congas. Insane the amount of people here on the street on Roosevelt here in Phoenix, Arizona. By the way, this is Roosevelt Avenue, and this area is apparently also called Roosevelt Row because of all the art and the restaurants. <laughs> Where exactly 
exactly what I expected, but it's pretty good. We are the show as you can imagine, the street musicians are my favorite part uh, so far. And some are really good, some hmm, work in progress. They have here what looks like cargo containers, but each one has a different art exhibition. Just a little bit crowded in here, and I am using the wide angle camera, so in reality, it is a lot more cramped than it looks on the video. These are like cargo containers with a little art exhibition inside each. This is really cool. Uh, what can I say? I like shiny lights. It's like something out of that movie Avatar, kind of. Here's more interesting stuff, jewelry, all kinds of artsy stuff for sale here. Kind of reminds me of our own Carnival on the Mile in Miami, kind of. There's food around here. Here's looking back real quick. Would you take a look at that? corner of 3rd and Roosevelt seem to be the epicenter here. More music. Yeah, a lot of these street musicians are good, but I am unimpressed with the audio quality. I guess that's the best they can do running on batteries, but still. I'm actually quite happy with the life I have. As I said earlier, better audio equipment would greatly enhance this, but well, it is what it is. Of course, you've got to have food trucks and dog-friendly restaurants. Yep, all kinds of music here. It gets even more crowded as the night goes on. Cool, a record store. Let's go in, let's check it out. Well, this certainly brings back memories. I used to love going to record stores. Peter Gabriel's Big Time also brings back memories of the 80s. Too many people, too many people. And the moon 
it's coming out. The motorhome experiment are here too, so I'm gonna see if I can find them. It's gonna be a challenge among all these people, but it might be possible. Selena back there, but I think she's having technical difficulties. Hey, I bumped into uh, the motorhome experiment. Paul and Lorraine, I'm tired, guys. It's, it's been a long day. He doesn't day. know who we are. And then Kevin and Laura, you, you guys probably know them from Paul and Lorena's channel. Yep. And uh, we're here. The first Friday. First Friday. I just found out about it. I was researching what to do in Phoenix, and this came up, and I have to go. Yeah, it's so, crazy people. Art, music, and crazy people. Everything. And obviously, everybody thought about the same thing because it's just crowded. Oh my God! Yes. And the moon's coming out. Look at the moon. Oh. We, did you did you catch it the other morning? The yes. blood moon. Yes. Oh, I hate you. All right, it was great seeing you guys once see again. again and, uh, see you on the Bye road. Now. Bye. 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 Oh, that was cool bumping into these guys again. I'm going back. Phoenix, Arizona. Where the sun is about to come out. Actually, not Phoenix. We are in Apache Junction at the KOA. But today we're going to Phoenix. That at one o'clock, that is a self-driving car by Waymo, which is the Google division in charge of the self-driving cars. And I guess they've been testing them here in Phoenix. Ideal conditions, perhaps, you know, polite drivers and good roads. It hardly ever rains. Before going to the city itself, I hear one of the best views of uh, Phoenix is from Dubbing's Lookout at South Mountain Park. So let's check it out. Okay, to make a long story short, I think I got lost. And maybe got confused by this closed road. I think I was supposed to continue straight, but I saw no signage anywhere for the aforementioned overlook. It is a pretty park though, with lots, and I mean lots of saguaro cacti and hiking trails and road cyclists. And on to Phoenix we go. going towards downtown on South Central Avenue and it definitely feels like a Hispanic neighborhood. I mean, most of the signs for the businesses are in Spanish. Pretty cool. Driving across the Salt River, we are almost there. Let's drive around a little bit and find the parking. Here we are by the University of Arizona, not to be confused with the University of Phoenix. I think I am going to come back to this area later. I'm going to park right here. And who would have thought I would find a painting of Havana here in Phoenix? Hmm. Yeah, I imagine this must be bustling with activity Monday through Friday. But today it is Saturday and aside for a few people, most of them homeless looking, there's not a whole lot going on here. Hmm, this is more like it. It must be the local residents. Well, 
not a very lively downtown, at least not on a Saturday. Most of the businesses are, are closed. I mean, Starbucks is open. So um, I'm just going to continue here and maybe go somewhere else. You said that Scotts, Scottsdale and Tempe are more lively. Lots of construction in this area as well. My timing, as usual, is impeccably off. It is 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Maybe in the afternoon it gets livelier. In any case, it is a good-looking downtown, architecture-wise. Since it is a little desolate here, I am going to drive a little further west towards the Arizona state capital. There it is. Before we go in, let's take a stroll here along Wesley Bowling Memorial Plaza. Oh yeah, that much is certain. The monument to Arizona casualties of the Korean War. USS Arizona in memory of the gallant men who gave their lives on December 7, 1941 on the battleship USS Arizona. And this park here is just the west of downtown. Here's the anchor from the USS Arizona, of course sunken during the Pearl Harbor attack. And towards the back, the restored gun barrel and the mast. And we can even see the Capitol building in the distance. Here's a closer look at the USS Arizona mast. Ernest McFarland and the American Dream. Here's the Ernest McFarland Memorial. He was a senator, a governor, chief justice, and even a television pioneer. Whiskey for drinking, water for fighting. That of course refers to the dispute between Arizona and California over the water rights to the Colorado River. Here's the Firefighters Memorial. The Enduring Freedom Memorial, of course recognizing those who fell during the current War on Terror era. Father Albert Brown Boethan. And here we have the Vietnam War Memorial and a monument to the Bill of Rights. And here's uh, the First Amendment. The gentleman on horseback is none other than Eusebio Francisco Quino, Jesuit missionary and explorer, a statue, a present from the adjacent Mexican state of Sonora. Maybe it's time now to go see the capital. Here we have another memorial and a replica of the Liberty Bell. Of course, sports are very important in any city and the Phoenix Suns uh, seem to be pretty legendary around these parts. Next, we have the USS Arizona Silver Service Collection. There are several other artifacts, including a piece of the ship itself. Now on to the second floor. In the Arizona Takes Shape exhibit, we learn some of the history of Arizona throughout the 1800s until it became a United States territory in 1863. On to the third floor.
here they have the state mine inspector's office and some rocks. Some items belonging to Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Here, let's walk into the historic house chamber, as it would have looked in 1910 during the Arizona Constitutional Convention. And the Speaker's office. And the Chief Clerk's office. I really like seeing all this old office equipment and the old GE electric fan to combat the fierce Arizona heat. I'm not going there. Might as well go all the way to the top, right? Now we are walking onto the House Gallery, which was a public place to observe the House in session. And this was in use until 1960. I love uh, visiting Capitol buildings. All right, let's continue exploring Phoenix or Scottsdale or Tempe, uh, you know, around the city. Well, I am driving back east towards the Arizona State University and this area called Heritage Square, located at the original town site of Phoenix. And there is uh, this uh, Victorian house with a museum dating back to the 1800s. Should be interesting. And here we are. It looks like they are having some antique car show. Event parking is $12. So, uh, and there's the children's museum. Oh well, yeah, event parking twelve dollars. It's not like I'm a cheap skate or anything like that. But no, <laughs> so I'm gonna go one more run, try to find a meter. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I'm going to Scottsdale. Turn right onto North Fifth Street. Found the meter, and I don't remember how much it was, but certainly a heck of a lot less than $12. You know, it is not like I'm going to be here all day. It's called the Mercado. Here at the ASU. Yes, this seems to be part of the Arizona State University. Obviously, not very crowded here on a weekend. Everything seems to be closed here on the weekends. So, well, let's go to the main event. Well, here we are. It's a free family festival, classic cars, culture, crafts. It is called the Motoring Through Time and Heritage Festival. And aside from the parking, it is free. Well, cool. It actually works. These are grinding sticks. If you need to hear a lot of grinding noises, you keep playing with these. <laughs> or if you do, or if you if you do them just right, they're quiet and it changes the gears. Well, that was a pretty cool vintage Bugatti. Yeah. The nineteen fifteen Willis Overland. Wouldn't it be nice to take this guy off road? Hmm. Maybe not. 1910 Hudson. 1915 Ford Model T. And 1916 Model T. I love these old cars. There's a very cool wooden teardrop. Another vintage teardrop, towed by a Packard, I think. There's a 1955 Field and Stream and a 55 Bel Air, one of my favorite cars of all time, besides the 57 Bel Air. 
By the way, that Victorian house we've been seeing is actually a museum nowadays, the Russian House Museum. It dates back to 1895. Of course, you've got to have baked goods, you know, why not? Mm, 1972 Porsche. And those fins, yeah, I knew they had to have a 57 Chevy Bel Air. Yeah, it's, uh, it was nice. That's my favorite car of all time. Check out that 1974 Bronco. Mm, believe it or not, I had never heard one of these in person. And it's amazing. Pure acoustic reproduction. Cool, he has a mock-up Cuban license plate on that Mustang. You're welcome. That's another beauty. Gran Turismo. To the record, Gran Turismo. And the band is getting ready to play. Give me an A, please. Pretty cool and serendipitous here in the, by the Arizona State University campus. And I saved myself $12 by walking two blocks. Okay, might as well, let's do it. Let's check Scottsdale off the list. I know there is so much more to see here, but you know what? I'm feeling a little off today. You know, my mom who was supposed to join me for this part of the trip. Instead, she's been playing up in Chicago in the snow and now she got a cold. So I don't think she's coming. Anyway, here we are, arriving at the Scottsdale waterfront. Let's check it out. Yep, this seems to be pretty upscale. Very, very nice. Here we have uh, some piece of street art called The Doors and Sound Passage. As you step inside, it is like being inside a kaleidoscope. Pretty cool. This is the Solari Pedestrian Bridge. The shadow of the bridge marks the different solar events such as uh, solstices and equinoxes and the solar noon. And uh, this colorful ribbon here is a temporary art installation here in Scottsdale uh, during the months of February and March. It is called Reflection Rising. Quite beautiful. You know what? I don't really feel like being here anymore, so let's move on. There's another self-driving car, this one by Uber. I'm free 
in my RV. Yeah, I'm riding. riding. I know there is a plethora of other things to see in this city, you know, museums. I actually wanted to hike Camelback Mountain and go to the Dubbings Lookout at South Mountain Park. Remember I got lost? And also the college town of Tempe, Cave Creek. And for crying out loud, sample some of the local cuisine and the wineries, breweries, you name it. But guess what? Now I have an excuse to come back next year. We are leaving Phoenix, so you can start saying goodbye to all the for a while because we are going to go up in elevation in a few here. Quite a bit, actually. I'm riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. I mean, and sometimes you gotta go 40 in a 60 mile an hour uh, zone because you just can't do it. Yep, we're gaining some serious elevation here. Heck, sometimes you have to go down to 30 or 35. See my temperature gauge? Yeah, in time I have learned to watch that gauge very closely when I'm towing uphill. And I have found out that as long as I slow down and take it easy, I can tackle almost any mountain so far. Ah, I think we've reached the top for now. Rest area, yeah, I need a break. It is called the Sunset Point Rest Area. coffee break. I've been told that the desert critters don't come out when it is cold, so we're safe. Well, in any case, it is a nice view and I needed a break. And there is Minitini, looking cute. I actually overheard some people at the rest area say how cool my little camper was. Well, let's continue. It is gorgeous out here. This downhill drive here is just gorgeous. As we approach Camp Verde and the Verde River and the Sedona Verde Valley, we're getting close. First, let's go see Montezuma Castle National Monument. I did some research on Google Maps and it looks like there is RV parking. Well, here we are. We are at Montezuma Castle. Here, actually, dip it in the... They have a small museum here explaining the history and you exit through the gift shop. It is such a gorgeous day. And there it is, what we came to see, the main cliff dwelling here. Well, the story goes, this used to be home to the southern Sinaguan people who lived here in the Verde Valley since around the year 700 and then in 1400 they just moved away. Nobody really knows why. The Sinaguans were farmers, hunter-gatherers, and at some point, just like the ancestral Pueblo people of Mesa Verde, they moved into cliff dwellings as well. And that's what we're seeing here. 
well, yeah, these were cliff dwellers, uh, very similar, I guess, or probably the same as the as the ancestral pueblo people we saw in Mesa Verde a couple of years ago. So yeah, very, very interesting, very cool. I got to use my my uh, annual pass for the first time. Well, apparently this was like an apartment building here. Uh, and according to the archaeologists, uh, it burned down at some point, but yeah, this is what remains. It was like six stories high. As we look at the rock face, we can only imagine what it must have looked like when the Sinagua people lived here. There are two other major sites in the area, Montezuma's Well and Tuzihut, but we're only going to visit this one today. The well doesn't have oversized parking, none that I can see in the satellite image, and Tuzihut, it's a little bit of a detour. In a couple of days, we're also going to visit the northern Sinaguans at Walnut Canyon, which is just east of Flagstaff, so stay tuned for that. Sinagua, by the way, comes from the Spanish words sin, meaning without, and agua, meaning water. So these are the people without water? The name was given by the Spaniards when they arrived and couldn't find any permanent rivers in the area. Well, let's continue. Sedona awaits. At 5,000 feet above sea level, it is getting a little hot in the engine bay and uh, people are passing me at double my speed. Well, there is snow up here. This burst can be worked. I have to climb to almost 7,000 feet though. I have decided to boondock at the Coconino National Forest, so I have to drive almost all the way to Flagstaff on I-17 and then backtrack a little bit south on the 89A, which gets really picturesque as you approach Sedona. I'm going to leave the trailer in the forest and continue with Kia on the steep grades and hairpin turns. We can see the San Francisco peaks in the distance, so we must be getting close. Here's where we go back south on the 89A. Here we are, our home for the night. Well, it is a little wetter and muddier than I expected. You know, even a little slippery. In fact, right here, turning right, my traction failed, my wheels spinned, and I almost hit that sign. First scurry moment of the week. Not the last one, for sure. More about that later. Let me just find the site and regroup here. This right here looks nice enough. Well, this is the Coconino National Forest. And guess what? This is where I'm staying. A little bit of a challenge coming down this road, but we'll be fine. To Sedona we go. It is past noon already, so we are not going to be able to do all that much today, but there's always tomorrow. 
going south on the 89A. It is the most picturesque segment of the road as we go through this canyon here. The part that I wanted to avoid towing the trailer, that's why I drove further north on I-17 and then backtracked. Slide Rock State Park. Which I'm gonna check it out tomorrow. Yep, yeah. wishful thinking. The sight of these rock formations is a sign we are getting close to our destination. And here we are, downtown Sedona. The pink Jeep tours seem to be a staple in this town. The landscape so uniquely beautiful. I actually stumbled upon this residential neighborhood and decided to explore. Figured the hill would give me a better view, but what I'm really looking for is the Chapel of the Holy Cross. And I think it's this way. There it is, on the left. Let's find parking. Do those look like people or is it just me? It is such a beautiful setting. Considered one of the seven man-made wonders of Arizona, this is one of the must-see sites here in Sedona. It was completed in 1956, inspired and commissioned by local rancher and sculptor Marguerite Brunswick Studd. out this landscape all around us. The contrast of the red rock and the green vegetation against the deep blue sky. It is so peaceful out here, as I walk down the ramp towards the parking lot. I think it is time to continue exploring Sedona.
Let's stop down here uh, one more time to get a better view. And they have porta potties. A little further down, we get this other view. And now for the final view. By the way, no RVs allowed. That is, of course, unless you have a fancy Class B. Okay, one last view of this wonderful structure, which seems to be wedged on the rock. It is almost surreal to finally be here and see it in person. Well, the day is quickly coming to an end, and I want to return to the forest before it gets dark, but before we go, there is one more place I want to see today. This is the spot called Lover's Knoll, and as suspected, it has a great view of these rock formations. I really wish I would have brought the drone, but you know, one of those things, I left in a bit of a hurry. Yeah, this is just awe-inspiring. What a great view. I'm going to drive a little further down this uh, road to this other vista point. Yeah, that's the shot right there between the trees. Well, it is time to return to my boondocking spot in the forest. And tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll return and do a hike. Or two. from the Coconino National Forest here in Arizona. That's where we slept last night. And uh, is that ice? Yep, the ground seems to be pretty frozen still, and so is old Kia. Yeah. We've got ice. Let's go back to Sedona and do a hike or two.
I am particularly interested in the Cathedral Rock hike and maybe one of the famous energy vortices in the area. Should be fun. Here we are, 9 a.m. in the morning, and not many people on the street. Not yet, anyways. Hmm, no drones. I'm telling you, they are banning them from all the cool places, but in all fairness, it looks like there is an airport nearby. Where you buy the pass. And then this you display in your car. to the Cathedral Rock. Well, so far, uh, so good here. We, I am not in the greatest of physical shapes, but I'm not too bad. And uh, yeah, it's up and up and up. Check out the other people on this rail up there. And I guess that was the easy part. Now comes the hard part. Well, I've certainly never climbed anything like that. very steep part of the trail I had to put down the camera because I needed my my hands to support myself to continue ascending here and I think I'm gonna have to put down the camera It looks like someone lost their hat here. Getting closer. Yeah, it's by far the, the hardest hike I've ever done. Oh yeah, by far the most difficult hike I've ever done. That part down there, you know, crawling through the rocks. Now this part is easy, easy peasy. Check out the view. Almost there. One thing for sure, the view is absolutely breathtaking. Check out the parking lot all the way down there. Well, I didn't quite make it all the way to the top. You know, a man has to know his limits. And uh, as it is, this is more than my limit. I think I pushed it. It's a beautiful view. I think it was worth it. Look at that. You know, let me give you a 360. Ah, maybe next time I'll make it to the top. You know. I've got to practice. Still a long way down, and that's Kia's somewhere down there. <laughs> <laughs> 
just just came down through there and now we continue I guess these piles of rocks uh, also mark the the trail going down without well, camcorder just had a glitch but apparently it is back <laughs> Yeah, don't tell anybody, but I dropped it on my way up. It wasn't a bad drop, but yeah. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be difficult. Yeah, it's so beautiful out here. I'm back at the parking lot for a quick break. I went to the car to take a break, get some water. And now I'm gonna attempt to do the to do the trail that goes to the it's a um, an energy vortex. It is called the Templeton Trail, and as you can see my camera is getting worse by the minute. As I confessed earlier. I did drop it on the way up to Cathedral Rock. Um, maybe cracked a circuit board or something. <laughs> I don't know. By the way, check out all these houses. They must have a tremendous view. We are getting close to the river, which is where the energy vortex is supposed to be. I think we're getting close. I hear water. Well, the camera finally died. Luckily, I still have my phone, at least for now. It's not the greatest, but uh, I have it. This here is called Oak Creek, and somewhere down there is the aforementioned energy vortex. The Red Rock Crossing Vortex, it's called. You've arrived. Mm -hmm. Well, vortex or no vortex, it is still a beautiful spot. No, it's not. Well, it's time to head back. I tell you I broke my good camera on the trail. Uh, luckily there is a Best Buy in Flagstaff and I'm gonna try to get something relatively inexpensive just to, to get by. Maybe I can get it fixed. Continue on back O beyond road for half a mile. I'm gonna have lunch here at the Cowboy Club. I sit at the bar, of course savoring a good local IPA and the cowboy barbecue plate. Mm, delicious. Well, if I was staying here tonight, I would probably have the wine tasting, but it'll have to be some other time. Well, this is kind of uh, the main strip here. 
downtown Sedona. Well, now for real, it is time to go. There is a vista point here, the Oak Creek Vista, overlooking the Sterling Canyon. Oh yeah, truly breathtaking views from up here. I mean, I wish my good camera was still working. And there is still snow on the side of the canyon. Also, here by the parking lot, they are selling Native American crafts and jewelry and all that good stuff. Before I go, let me show you my environs right here in the middle of the Coconino National Forest. Okay, to Flagstaff we go. Well, this is for sure the highest we've ever been, 7,000 feet. There's an RV park right here to the right. Maybe I should call and find out if they have vacancy, but you know what? First things first. Let's buy that temporary camcorder. Hmm, there's a better spot here. The RV park is called Black Bart's and they even have a steakhouse. Let's go for a quick uh, drive around the town. Well, let's explore Flagstaff just a little bit. Take the next right onto North San Francisco Street, then your destination will be on the right. And while we're at it, uh, let's put this new chip replacement camcorder through a quick test here. It'll have to get me by for the rest of the trip, you know. Here's the famous Monte Vista Hotel, as I look for parking here. There's the courthouse. And there is Route 66, which we will tackle on the next video. Here's the Orpheum Theatre, dating back to 1911.
all the snow on the street. Okay, let's continue. Being the astronomy buff or enthusiast that I am, I want to see the Lowell Observatory. It is on top of a hill, pretty close to downtown. It looks like we're going to get a pretty good view from here, so let's park. Here, let's enter here. It was originally established in 1894, and it was here that the former planet Pluto was discovered back in 1930. to see the observatory, but I'm really tired, as you can probably tell. It's, uh, it's $15 uh, admission, so... I don't know if for the amount of time that I'm going to be here, if it is worth it. It seems to be geared more uh, for children, really. Although it would have been uh, cool uh, uh, to see the place where they discovered uh, the planet that is no longer a planet. No, that, that, that is not the point. Like the kaleidoscope. Oh well. Let me see if we can go there just to see the, the cupola. And then I think I'm gonna go back to the RV park and edit some video. There it is. RV park here in, uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. They do have a steakhouse, but I, I didn't go last night. And um, well, today we continue east, getting our kicks on Route 66. Here we are on the Mother Road, and the first point of interest we're going to visit is Walnut Canyon National Monument. Well, here we are, Walnut Canyon National Monument. The museum inside depicts the life of the Sinagua people. Here's the, the loop trail. Well, this one is called the Island Trail. It takes about an hour, she said. It's about a mile. So, let's check it out. Very nice. These, by the way, were the same cliff-dwelling people who inhabited Montezuma Castle in the Verde Valley, which I visited a couple of days ago. The Sinagua, in Spanish, the people without water, lived in this area sometime before the year 1250. But it is almost impossible to know with certainty how they lived because they left no written language. Their history has been pieced together by examining objects and comparing them with other prehistoric groups and through the oral traditions of the Hopi, 
which are most likely descendants of the Sinagua. Pine. These walls could talk. <laughs> A lot of it is reconstructed, you know that. I mean, I do like the fact that it is smaller than my other camera, but then the viewfinder quality is not the same, uh, the, the dynamic range is not the same, the stabilization is definitely not the same, and it is, um, and it is, it is not 4K. But the autofocus is faster, and uh, we'll see how accurate the colors really are. Well, anyways, this, <laughs> check out all the cliff dwellings here. sunny side, the south side of the canyon. Vegetation is different. And there. You see there's still snow on the ground. We'll check it out. There's another dwelling there on the other side of the canyon. Ooh, I'm gonna have to go all the way back there. Starting to get a little out of breath here. We're almost at 7,000 feet above sea level. Well, yes, it is a beautiful canyon. Although we must continue soon. Check out the San Francisco peaks in the distance. Well, there is another trail that goes around the rim. But if I want to make it to Albuquerque today, I gotta keep going. Oh, look at that. Route 66 is nearly non-existent in this area, so it is going to be I-40 for the most part. Still, we are going to see some points of interest along the way. Here, for example, we encounter Twin Arrows. It was originally a trading post, now abandoned. Apparently, it closed down in 1998 and even though the building sits in ruins, the two arrows were restored by the Hopi tribe and Route 66 enthusiasts back in 2009. This was probably part of a diner. Yeah, 
Yeah, the city is completely abandoned. Check out the kitchen. It's completely abandoned and probably unsafe to be in here, to be honest about it. Check out that roof. It is a sad reality that a lot of structures sit like this along the side of the road. Not only on Route 66, other roads as well. Sometimes I fail to see the quote-unquote historic value of keeping something like this in such decay. But that's just me. This is the building I was just in. It was called the Twin Arrows Trading Post. Right here they have like a garage. And that's your Twin Arrows and uh, the very famous Mini Tini. Let's go to the modern uh, Twin Arrows Casino for breakfast. Well, this is actually one of the places that I had considered uh, last night for overnighting. Uh, we have a nice uh, Thor Ace. And this is the, the Twin Arrows Casino. It is kind of here in the, in the middle of nowhere. Well, hello there. Well, this is called the Four Elements Cafe. Well, here's my Navajo breakfast. Check out this lamp. What a mess. <sighs> I guess this cabinet opened and um, all my stuff went on the floor. Well, yeah, that was probably that bump on the road I hit when I was entering the casino. This is the ghost town of two guns. Well, this is what remains of old Route 66 in this area. This is the, the ghost town uh, called uh, Two Guns. Yep. This here was all part of a zoo that had mountain lions and other Arizona native animals. In fact, after the late 1920s when Route 66 first passed through here, this became a full-blown tourist trap. Here, in these chicken wire cages, is where they kept the mountain lions. They also had something called the Apache Death Cave, which is still here somewhere nearby. To make a long story short, the town was always riddled with bad luck, which some called a curse, and all that ended with a fire in 1971. Here's what remains of the gas station. Probably not too safe to be walking around here, but I'm going to do it anyways, in the interest of historical research, I guess. Here. Talking about a curse, I had uh, the great idea to try to continue on Route 66. It looked like a normal road on Google Maps, and since I was trying to save data, I neglected to check the satellite map. Yeah, big mistake. Well, this is what remains of old Route 66, not very well maintained these days. We're running almost parallel to uh, I-40. 
At the beginning, it actually looked like a relatively well-maintained dirt road, so I kept going. Soon, it became evident I had made a mistake, as the road became virtually non-existent. And since it had fences on both sides, there was no room to make a U-turn. Trust me, I did try, but no, couldn't make it. I also tried driving backwards, but I had driven too long a distance. It would have been extremely difficult to make it back. I was really in a pinch here. I was getting desperate at this point, so I decided to try something radical, like backing into one of the fences until I actually pushed it a little bit, and then back and forth, back and forth again and again, patiently. Eventually, I was able to make that U-turn and return back to safety. Let's make sure Minitini is still in one piece though. Okay, let's not do that again. Our next stop is the Meteor Crater! Oh, bummer. And by the way, they do offer RV parking. I'm here with all the other RVs. There's even a Phoenix Cruiser. I guess I won't be flying the drone here. According to them, they're running a special today for $11. It's usually $18. And uh, your America the Beautiful Pass is no good here. This is uh, privately owned, so one thing to note. Here we are. Here they have an, an Apollo te test capsule. The mountain is beautifully framed. American Astronaut Hall of Fame. Starting with Alan B. Shepard, of course. Kind of does look like a painting, doesn't it? Until you move, it moves with you. Well, it's a nice view, for sure. Until the early 20th century, the crater was actually believed to be volcanic in origin. But further testing and science has proven that it was formed by a meteor impact about 50,000 years ago. It was a 150 feet wide meteorite that created this huge crater, 700 feet deep and 4,000 feet across. Is it worth 11 bucks to see this hole on the ground? Or? Only you can be the judge of that. It's pretty cool uh, for me being a kind of a fan of these uh, celestial things. It's pretty cool. I'm gonna go to the lower platform and then we continue towards Albuquerque. We're late. At one point in history, they tried excavating and drilling in an effort to find the meteor but it is nowadays believed to have disintegrated on impact. Okay, it's time to continue. We continue due east on I-40, which as you can see in this area has completely replaced Route 66. Our next point of interest, what remains of the Meteor City Trading Post? Well, here's uh, another abandoned structure here in uh, an old Route 66, and this is the the Meteor City 
trading past. Prost. They have these TVs here. Let's see what they look like inside. Uh, they don't look like much. It's all abandoned, as you can see. Dating back to 1938, the trading post finally closed its doors in 2012, and it has been vandalized and in ruins ever since. Let's continue. Albuquerque is that way. Okay, next stop, Winslow, Arizona. Here we are, arriving by that famous corner in Winslow, Arizona, immortalized by the Eagles and their 1972 hit, Take It Easy. Let's find parking. Well, here we are, standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. This is not the correct corner, though. We have to turn around here. Well, it's a thing. Yep, the corner store is blasting Eagles music in a loop. And I do believe the song talks about a flatbed Ford. Well, there it is. Oh, here I am standing on the famous corner in Winslow, Arizona with the Eagles and uh, the famous red pickup truck, of course. Check it out. Standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. <laughs> and they're playing the Eagles at the store. Hotel California, wrong song, but anyway. Well, they're certainly um, milking this corner for all it's worth, huh? We continue. Here's the Chola power plant near Joseph City. We are going towards Holbrook, another historic Route 66 town. This is also the gateway to the petrified Forest National Park, which I really wanted to visit, but I made the mistake of making a reservation in Albuquerque. So we have to make it there at some point today. And time's running out. At least I found this place with all this petrified wood. I'm not gonna make it to a petrified Forest National Park, but they have some petrified wood here. Crystallized. All right. And this guy here, this store, they have a lot of petrified wood. But as always, I miscalculated time. And I have to be in Albuquerque because I had a reservation, although I'm gonna be late. Already called. Call the KOA for a late checking.
that, we say goodbye to Arizona. And welcome to Nuevo Mexico. Welcome to New Mexico. Center. Well, I've got a nice uh, road map. I'm gonna um, take a picture right here and uh, make some coffee and continue on the road. We're going to pass by one last town here, Gallup, New Mexico, before it gets dark. Here we are, El Rancho being one of the more recognizable landmarks. We're actually just going to cruise along uh, this section of Route 66 here in Gallup. One of the towns actually mentioned in the famous song about Route 66. Turkey at night, which is not my favorite thing, but yeah, we saw a lot today. It's a beautiful area around here. As night falls, we continue pushing east towards Albuquerque, New Mexico. Riding, riding with my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. Let's begin by driving up to Santa Fe, New Mexico's capital. I'm starting to see some adobe style buildings, so we must be getting close. Actually, let's park right here. Well, here I parked, $2 an hour, not too bad. Hotel made to look like, a, like an ancient Pueblo. Here we have the Loreto Chapel, famous for its miraculous spiral staircase, which seems to defy the laws of physics. And we're going to see it here in a bit. This was actually the first Gothic building west of the Mississippi, built in the 1870s. It's only three dollars to see it, so that's reasonable. Nowadays the chapel only works as a museum and for special events like weddings. There's the miraculous stair in the back. The fact that it has no central pole to support it is what makes it so peculiar. It is also supposed to be a remarkable feat of woodworking, especially with the crude hand tools of the era in which it was constructed. Is 
here we have another look at the gothic facade and this nice park here with all the wind spinners. I continue walking around, admiring all the quirky art everywhere. And I think maybe I made a scheduling mistake again, because the town is pretty much deserted. Here was my plan, uh, see a bit of Santa Fe in the morning, then have lunch, and then go to the Taos Pueblo, which is about an hour and a half away. I think maybe I should have reversed it and done Taos in the morning and then Santa Fe in the afternoon, when it is more lively. And it seems like it might be a really touristy area at the right time, which is not right now. Here's the Santa Fe Plaza. And uh, check it out, an old GMC. I love those old motorhomes. I continue walking around the plaza, admiring all the adobe style buildings. This one in particular is the Palace of the Governors, with some Native American craft vendors outside. Inside, it is a museum, but I didn't feel like paying for the full tour, not in the museum mood today. It is actually the oldest continuously occupied public building in the United States, believed to have been constructed in around 1610, and lots of Native American crafts, and lots of museums in this area. continue walking around, wandering into these interior patios here. This one, a shop called the Rainbow Man. Here's one of the restaurants uh, that I'm actually considering for lunch later today. Let's go and see the cathedral. This building here with the colorful columns is the Contemporary Native American Art Museum. And there it is the Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, commonly known as just uh, the St. Francis Cathedral. The Romanesque Revival building dates back to the 1880s, uh, built on the site of an older adobe-style church, which was called La Parroquia. There's a Saint Francis, surrounded by all the saints of the New World. Here's the very ornate uh, Our Lady of the Rosary Chapel. Well, yeah, that was the cathedral, very beautiful inside. And uh, let's continue exploring. It's, it's very quiet today here in, in Santa Fe. But we'll continue exploring and we'll see what we can find. <laughs> the 
Diego de Vargas Zapata. In this area, we encounter a bunch of art galleries as we walk towards Canyon Road, which is supposedly an artsy neighborhood around here. Here we have the New Mexico School for the Arts. How appropriate, huh? It turns out, however, that people don't usually go out to look at art in the morning. Who would have thought? This canyon road is listed as one of the top things to do here in, in Santa Fe. It's very, very, very eerie feeling that there's nobody on the streets. Absolutely no one. seen the real ones all over the place here in the city. Apparently this is the river down there. Well, the river is kind of uh, frozen here. Yeah, this is the famous desert inn where the Santa Fe Bight is located. It's a government building, New Mexico State Land Office. Here we have it, the New Mexico State uh, Capitol building. Let's continue exploring. And there is what is called the family sculpture here in front of the Capitol, also called the Roundhouse. It's becoming a little more lively as the day progresses. Well, if you are into colorful Native American garments, there is plenty of that here. Let's go find something to eat, with chilies in it, preferably. Okay. Well, that Casa Sena place looked uh, fancy, so let's check out the shed one more time. Well, I'm gonna begin with a local IPA, as it is my tradition now, and it is very nice here, good service. I am having the carne adobada, mm, very spicy. Okay, let's go. Oh, off we go. That was by far the, the spiciest uh, meal I've ever had. Let's get back to the car. Yeah, that's it. Funny thing, as I get ready to leave town, it is getting livelier around here. They even have live mariachi music at the plaza now. Hey, but wait, that's La Bikina, one of my favorite Mexican songs. There's something about the cadence and the harmonic progressions and the rhythm. Yeah. Well, 
as much as I am enjoying the music, I'm gonna have to get going. I've got more stuff to show you. How about we go to the oldest house, not only here in Santa Fe, but in the whole entire United States. The oldest house in the USA from 1646. We enter through the gift shop. This section here is an 800-year-old adobe house. Although the three rings date the house to about 1646, it is believed this part of the structure itself might be older, even dating back to the 1200s. So this is what it must have looked like back in the day. There's a coffin, of course. Well, that was the oldest house in the USA. How cool is that? Serendipitously, I uh, just happened to to pass by it. Taos Pueblo may close within one hour of when you arrive. Head southeast on east of Vargas Street toward Orchard Drive. There. I know I should have done Taos Pueblo earlier, but uh, now I've got less than an hour. Well, I changed my mind. We are not going to Taos after all. Perhaps another trip. Actually, a viewer recommended this place in the mountains called Tent Rocks. So I'm going to try and make it there. Of course, Los Alamos, you know, where they invented the atomic bomb? Uh, and I was just oblivious when I passed the checkpoint. Who knows what kind of secret military stuff they're making here these days. By the way, we are really going up in elevation here. More research should have gone into this, for sure. There, some local wildlife. So cool. My altimeter says that we are 8,000 feet above sea level. Then 8,900. We're really way up here. This is called uh, Valle Grande. Of course, we still have quite a bit of snow here on the side of the road. Yep. Alright, let's continue. I'm supposed to turn left here, but I think we may have a problem. The road seems to be closed. Yeah, that's a fail of epic proportions after so much driving, but hey, at least we got to see the snow 
and the mountains and the prettiest scenery and the highest old Kia has ever been for sure. Let's go back to Albuquerque. Actually, the RV park is in a suburb called Bernalillo. going through the Jemez Pueblo here. And yeah, we're stuck behind the school bus. Our luck. We'll be there soon. The sight of the Sandia Mountains means we are getting really close. Well, hopefully today we've done a little better planning than yesterday and uh, the first thing I'm going to go to, um, to the old Albuquerque area maybe have some breakfast and then we're gonna do some Breaking Bad locations and then we'll see Here we are, old Albuquerque. Let's find parking. Well, once again, it's dead here early in the morning, so we'll be back later. Although I was getting kind of hungry, but I can't wait. So I stumbled upon the visitors, uh, visitors information center. What a concept, right? And I uh, spoke to a very knowledgeable, very nice lady there. And uh, apparently nothing opens here in downtown uh, or in Old Town, rather. Take the next right onto South Plaza Street Northwest. Then turn left onto Rio Grande Boulevard Northwest. Uh, until like 10 or 11 a.m. So, okay, that's that. So, uh, what I'm going to do now in the morning... Turn I'm going left to... onto Rio Grande Boulevard Northwest. She... Then turn right onto Central Avenue Northwest. If she lets me talk, I'm going to do the, the Breaking Bad locations. Not the one that is really far away in the middle of the desert because uh, it's like 40 minute drive and I know a 40 minute drive usually turns into an hour or two hours. But I'm going to go to like like Los Pollos Hermanos, the car wash, uh, Walter uh, White's uh, house. And then I'm going to come back here to the, the restaurant that I was uh, going to um, come to anyways, which is the church. Take the next right onto Central Avenue Northwest, Route 66. And she recommended that, yeah, it is the oldest uh, restaurant in town, so I'm going to have an early lunch there, probably... Uh, Continue on the, Central Avenue Northwest for one mile. Around 11-ish. And then there's a post office. I have to mail uh, a sticker to, to England, so I'm going to mail it from there, and then we'll see. There's so much to do. There's the Nuclear Energy Museum. There's, of course, the Sandia Peak Tramway. There's Nob Hill. Although she says that Nob Hill is under construction, so it may not be the, like, the greatest experience. So we'll take it from there. By the way, she also had a map of all the Breaking Bad locations. And I was, I was even considering taking a tour, but you know, I made myself a, a little bit a tour here. I saved some of the locations in the, in Google Maps, and I'm just going to, you know, explore. Oh, by the way, if you're not really into Breaking Bad, feel free to skip ahead about three minutes or so, and we'll continue exploring the rest of Albuquerque after that. Here we are at the infamous location of Los Pollos Hermanos, which is twisters, uh, burgers and burritos, a uh, fast food chain here in New Mexico and Colorado. Let's go inside. I'm not gonna eat, I just want to see it. Of course, they have a Pollos Hermanos sign right by the entrance. Hi, good morning. Well, let's uh, make sure that uh, we don't have any GPS uh, trackers here. In Olukia, and uh, 
we'll be on our way. We continue on our Breaking Bad Locations tour. I know, old Kia is kind of filthy and in a bad need of a car wash, but that's not why we're here. This is the car wash from the TV series. I was tempted to uh, do a car wash, you know, patronize the, the building, the, the business, but... Right, let's continue towards Walter White's house. How about that? They got the same idea as I did, or maybe they're cooking meth in there. Either or. Uh, yeah, the new owners have put up fences and cones. I don't think they are thrilled with the idea of having a famous house. And they have a sign that says, Take your pictures from across the street, do not disturb. But I won't disturb them. I just want to throw a, a pizza on that roof. I'm leaving. Let's find another. Oh, by the way, the guys uh, in the RV, I think they were taking pictures of the wrong house. <laughs> okay, let's go. Actually, if I owned that house, I would decorate it just like in the TV series and offer tours. Uh, but then I guess I would have to license the rights. It might not be worth it. Anyways, I'm not gonna spend my whole morning on this, so last but not least is one of my favorite locations, Hank and Marie's house. You know, the cop brother-in-law, and it is located on the foothills of the Sandia Mountains, in the very nice Glenwood Hills neighborhood. That's the one! Down the hill we go. By the way, there was a trailhead at the end of this street. Maybe we can do it some other time. The next time we come to Albuquerque, for sure. Well, the idea now, I'm going to take a historic Route 66 into town. I don't know how long that's gonna take, but sounds uh, sensible. And then uh, we're gonna have breakfast at the old town. This here is Central Avenue, which became part of uh, historic Route 66 back in 1937, you know, when the road came through here. And we're going to be approaching here a neighborhood called Nub Hill, which is uh, supposed to be very lively with this eclectic mix of locally owned businesses. Might as well make it all the way to downtown, right? This here is the Civic Plaza, and apparently they do concerts and special events, and when it is not in use, it is a great spot for the homeless to charge their phones. I hear. What does this building remind you of? It's like the Inter-American Plaza in Miami. We are back by Old Town. Let's check out Old Town here in uh, Albuquerque. And we're back here. This place is supposed to be right behind the church. Now I am really getting hungry, so let's go to that church street cafe to have an early Maybe, lunch. I think uh, that's it over there. Here we are, Church Street Cafe. I start with a coffee because I thought it was going to be breakfast, actually. This is apparently the oldest house 
Then I changed my mind to a local IPA because you know what? It is almost noon. This is the combination platter. Some bread and everything. The tamale and enchilada. I, I think it's a chile relleno. Bread is fantastic. A bit pricey, but it was really good. And well, you know, you are in a historic building after all. Well, that was a very, very good meal. Check it out. Well, that was uh, very nice, by far the, the best meal I've had in New Mexico, so very pleased and it is supposed to, supposedly the oldest private residence here in the city, as I mentioned, owned until 1991 by the same family. All right, let's continue exploring Old Town a little bit here. All these shops here in the back. This little alley here. I am back by the Old Town Plaza and the San Felipe de Neri Church. Here's the official historic marker. Here we have these cannons. And Native American crafts. Let's uh, check out the church. 1793. This here, the church, is the oldest building in the whole city and the only building here in Old Town proven to date back to the Spanish colonial era. Although, it did go through some remodeling after 1817, like the bell towers and the pitched roof and the interior decorations, uh, those are newer. Well, I think we've seen enough here for today, uh, so I'm just going to slowly walk back to the car, admiring all this adobe-style architecture, uh, the chili peppers ever-present everywhere. Here's another restaurant I was considering for lunch today, although I think I made the right choice. Here's the main entrance to the old town area. So this is Don Francisco Cuervo y Valdez, founder of Albuquerque, April 23rd, 1706. The plan is we're going to go see some nuclear weapons. Nuclear or nuclear, how do you say it? Anyways. Saying goodbye to old, uh, um, I don't even know where I am, Albuquerque. <laughs> Take the next left onto San Felipe Street Northwest. Thank you. Check it out, Old Town. Eight hundred feet. Turn left onto Mountain Road Northwest. You see the church? Yeah. We are going to transition here from colonial Spanish history and old Mexico to a much more recent time period, the Cold War. Our next destination is the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, which I am really looking forward to because I grew up during the Cold War and I was stuck on the other side of the Iron Curtain, kind of. And so it is a very interesting historical period for me personally. Here we are. Adult admission is $12. In this first uh, section, we learn about some of the people involved in the study of the atom, 
and uh, Einstein's letter to President Roosevelt. World War II and Hitler and the Holocaust and the nuclear threat. And then we get to see some artifacts from the era, from the different countries involved. The Manhattan Project that involved the design, assembly and testing of the first atomic bomb in nearby Los Alamos, very close to here actually. Uh, fascinating stuff. Here's a replica of Fat Man, which was the bomb detonated over the city of Nagasaki, Japan. This flag flew at the site of the first atomic test, the limo that transported the scientists of the Manhattan Project. Gadget, the first atomic device ever tested, the Nagasaki aftermath. A Soviet section, perhaps? Ever wonder what a fallout shelter used to look like back in the 60s? Yeah. There is so much stuff here. I could make a one-hour video of the museum alone, but don't worry. I'm not going to do that. Here's a section about nuclear medicine, you see? It's not all war and doom and gloom. There have been actually many contributions to the advancement of medical technology. There's another section on radiation. They even have a Geiger counter here measuring the radioactivity of different materials. Electric power! And of course, a pretty substantial section about atomic pop culture. There is, of course, a famous DeLorean and something called a flux capacitor. Great Scott! Well, as I said, we could spend hours here, but before we go, let's step outside into what they call the Heritage Park. As I step outside, a museum doesn't, a very nice guy, follows me around everywhere and explains everything actually, like the fact that this F-16 would be carrying a hydrogen bomb under its wing and heat-seeking missiles. And, um, yeah. Here's a B-29 Super Fortress, just like the one that dropped the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was from a tower like this one that they tested the gadget, the first nuclear bomb, at White Sands, actually, on the next video we are going there. Here's a Nike missile, with some of those at the Everglades not long ago. This, of course, is the legendary B-52. I recently had a chance to see one of these up in the air, and all I can say is, what a sight! This thing is majestic. It is almost the size of the whole museum building. And that's where they kept the hydrogen bomb down there. This here is the B-47 Stratajet, nicknamed the Widowmaker. Wonder why. It looks to me like an oversized fighter jet. And according to my guide, the pilots used to say that once it was up in the air, it actually handled like one. We move on to the rockets, the intercontinental ballistic missiles. But at this point, it is information overload. I believe this is the Titan II, a staple during the Cold War, always ready to be launched, pointing at the Soviet Union, of course. This one's called this the Peacekeeper. One. The Peacekeeper. And this is a four stage. It's 
special type of epoxy. Let's see. Kept it right. Here's once again the Titan II, which was designed so it could fit on a truck on the highway and under most tunnels. Cool. Now we go to the to the tramway to the Sandia Peak. Well, yes, we are going to do one more thing today before returning to the campground, and that is another one of the top ten things to do here: the Sandia Peak Tramway. There is actually so much more to do here, really, but I only allocated one day on this particular trip. More like an overview of the city, this is. You can bet we'll be back here sooner than later. We're going north on Tramway Boulevard here, which actually hugs the eastern city limit and eventually will take us to the tramway. I'm doing great, how are you? Great, it's a beautiful day, I'm on the mountain. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so good. to be here. <laughs> Have you been uh, before? No, first time. Where are you from? In Miami, Florida. Miami, whoo, a little fly yeah. over there. Yeah, and lower. Worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> been there, it's a nice town. Yeah, it's so good. Well, two whole dollars. It's two whole dollars to go yep. over there, right? Okay. And then, how much is the tram to go? To the $25? 25 dollars? 25. 20 okay. if you're a senior, well. No, not yet, not quite school. yet. I'll take it. <laughs> Just follow this road around it just landed you may be able to catch it all right if thank you next will be down 15 minutes all right perfect thank you so much well, let's take the sandia peak tramway The 50-year-old tramway goes from 6,500 feet above sea level all the way to 10,000 feet along 2.7 miles of cable. As we ascend, we're going into the Cibola National Forest, passing Tower 1 now. From here up, the tramway was constructed by helicopter. 5,000 helicopter rides it took. Mount Taylor is a mountain about 75 miles to the west there. It's about 1,000 feet higher than we are. And it is a dormant volcano. So just to give you guys an idea of how big things really are from the tram, on the right-hand side here, we're passing Fish Rock. And then right out back there on top of that hill, there's a big boulder perched on top. It looks curiously like a cannon. We're real imaginative. We call it Cannon Rock. It's about the same size as this cabin. So things on the outside of the tram are much larger than they appear. And you can see Cabazone from here too. If you look out to the northwest on the horizon out there, it looks like an Audi belly button sticking up out of the horizon. That's the, that's a El Cabazone, that's the hollowed out core of an extinct volcano. There's the mark from a lightning strike that looks like a face, or a skull, rather. At the very tippy tip top of that mountain up there, there's a little small square granite cabin with a little black window. And the longer you look for it, the easier it is to see. I know that sounds weird, but it's totally up there. And it's right where the sky meets the tippy top of that mountain up there. And that was built in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was built to house workers that worked up there a long time ago. That doesn't use it for anything anymore. It's just a national monument. But y'all can hike there. It's about a three mile round trip hike from Upper Terminal to Kiwanis and back. We've made it to the top. Well, what do you know? There is snow up here. No drones. 
why am I not surprised? Here's the view looking towards the other side, to the east. So beautiful. There is our tram car going back down. There is pretty good Wi-Fi here in Upper Terminal, so if you recall, I did a live video from up here back in February. Such a commanding view. Ready to head back down. Not many people going down now because a lot of people come up here to see the sunset. So it is coming up full and going down nearly empty. By the way, Sandia means watermelon in Spanish, and the mountain at sunset, due to its color, it kind of looks like a sliced watermelon, I guess. Yeah, I kind of see how it could look like a sliced watermelon. I'm actually glad that the tram is coming back down nearly empty, because it is so much better to take in the views. There comes the other car. So, uh, we are... so this must be tons of people going up because they want to see the sunset or? No, usually, like we usually get busy around this time. We are almost back at ground level. Let's drive back to the campground as the day comes to an end. Oh, by the way, did I mention that there is a brewery right next to the campground? Yeah, I think it's through here. There is a brewery. And there is a brewery. Yeah, it's pretty cool in there. What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in Key West? I am eating buffalo frito pie and an IPA, of course. Well, it is our last sunset here in the West. But it's a beautiful one. Well, for sure I am going to miss having the Sandia Mountains in my backyard. But the show must go on.
tell you what, I think it is time that, so for us to put a, a New Mexico sticker. So I'm gonna do that right now. Here's my my remaining stickers here on my map. Uh, let's uh, put up New Mexico and then I'll tell you what I intend to do here. By the way, a lot of people have asked me uh, where I got this map. And, and you know, this is the store that we all love to hate, uh, um, Camping World. I got it at the pop-up store that they usually have at the Tampa RV show. I got it the same year that we got a minute in the trailer, 2015 and uh, 2014 actually. And let me tell you about, um, actually, January 2015 we got it. Let me tell you about my map and what I intend to do because as you can see, I'm about halfway done with the United States. I think I have like 25 states uh, left exactly. So uh, now in, in the fall, we're gonna, I'm gonna cover this whole area here because I've driven through many of these states but I haven't actually uh, been in any of those states and my premise for this map is I, I either have to sleep or do something significant uh, in the state and I kind of cheated with Alabama because all I did was have lunch and I rest up but I didn't want to have this uh, gaping hole here in the south so let's head south I am leaving Albuquerque and uh, I've been going back and forth, you know, changing my plans. Originally I wanted to go to, um, uh, go through Amarillo, Texas, you know, to take uh, the part of Route 66 along the way, but uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Okay, let me stop real quick, I, I think I forgot to, to close my basement. Or, storage, whatever it's called. <laughs> okay, I closed it, but I didn't lock it. Let me, I'll be right back. Well, as I was saying, there's a storm coming and um, a, a winter storm, maybe. It, it, it might even rain here in Albuquerque. So, I have to head back south. I'm going to El Paso. Texas once again and then I'm gonna take I-10 East all the way back um, the one positive thing take about the next right onto South Hill Road thank you Google lady and then the, the, the one positive positive thing about this is that I might be able to stop for a few hours in uh, San Antonio which will be cool because it's uh, I've heard it's a very neat uh, city well, this is where I stayed Bernalillo. Riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. Wherever I want to be Cause I'm free in my RV yeah. Let's fly the drone here one more time Landing Well, yes this is when the drone decided to land by itself on the other side of the highway. Stop landing. Stop la stop landing. I was able to take control and bring it back as fast as I could. But it was a scary moment for sure. This is breakfast here at the rest area. I'm heating up some, I made like a wrap with ham and cheese with those new uh, tortillas I bought in New Mexico. And here we are at the rest area. 
We Are Going South on I-25. Then at San Antonio, New Mexico here, which if you blink, you missed it, we turn onto US 380 East. It is such a beautiful drive. I mean, you all know I have a thing for the mountains and the deserts, right? This darker area up ahead is the Carrizoso Malpais lava flow, which was caused by an eruption about 5,000 years ago. See how it looks on the satellite image? Valley of Fires recreation area is here towards the end. And what a desolate place this is. We arrive by the town of Carrizoso, uh, where we are going to refuel and join US 54 South. As you can see, the landscape is starting to change. And here we are. This adobe-style building under renovations is the visitor center. Hi, how are you? Thank you. I have the annual pass. There you are. Alright, thank you so much. Oh, no drones, okay. Yep, drones are forbidden here too. And here it kind of makes sense since we are so close to several military facilities, most notably the White Sands Missile Range, home of the Trinity site, where on July 16th, 1945, they detonated Gadget, the first nuclear weapon ever. Alright, let's stop at this trailhead here. It's Minitini in the house, or on the sand, rather. Well, let's uh, let's uh, take this uh, boardwalk. Here is called the Interdune Boardwalk. Here's some of the plant life we might be seeing here in the sand dunes. Let's continue. Here we have more infographics and signs talking about the fauna and the flora of this very interesting place. continue, immersing ourselves into this surreal, otherworldly landscape. For a little hike. Well, it is a five mile trail. I'm obviously not gonna do the whole thing, but let's just walk, you know, over the dunes and back. And this is the Alcali Flat Trail. Amazing. 
What we're seeing here is gypsum sand, and the bright dots are selenite crystals. This type of sand, I've learned, is quite rare because it is water soluble. Uh, good thing it doesn't rain here very much. These sand dunes are also very popular for downhill sledding, and because of its composition, the sand never gets very hot, not even on the hottest summer days. People from all over the world come visit this marvelous place. Well, let me just give you a 360 here of the of the White Sands National Monument. And as the name indicates, it's all white sand. It's kind of off-white, but those sand dunes, it's, it's amazing. How they look. Especially those back, back there. That's really cool with the, with the mountains behind them. Really cool place. But, uh, Texas awaits, so we're gonna continue on our journey. Next time I come though, I'm doing that five uh, mile loop. Is it five miles? Three miles? I forgot. Uh, bring some water. Well, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Amazing place, the White Sands uh, National Monument. I mean, look at look at it. It's, it's like we are in the. I don't know. I know. I don't know where we are, but it's it's not Earth for sure. Let's continue towards the land not to be messed with, the Lone Star State, Texas. Welcome to Texas. Well, it was bound to happen. I get stuck in some rush hour traffic here just west of El Paso. My next stop is Cattleman's Ranch Steakhouse, which I've heard great things about. And while it is going to be a little bit on the pricey side, I figured you've got to have at least one great steak while in Texas, right? So I've decided to splurge tonight. Mm, well, when nature calls... Yes, the ranch is a little bit out of the way at the Indian Cliffs Ranch, a good 10 miles north of I-10. I arrive right at sunset.
it is a huge property, a very pretty, very well maintained. Luckily, they have RV parking, so they direct me to park right behind this Class A diesel pusher. Beautiful. I'm here at the Cattleman's Ranch, and I'm parked here with another RV. Check out these guys. very well nourished here. It is a beautiful evening here in Western Texas. Let's go inside. I feel particularly odd being here by myself, especially since there is no cell phone signal. So my only entertainment is other people's conversations and the menu. Well, my ribeye is here with baked potato, coleslaw, bread, and mm, baked beans. Well, yeah, I knew this was going to be an expensive meal. Uh, my last restaurant meal of the whole trip. Well, this place is huge. But a pretty good, pretty good steak. I approve. Of course, there's a horse. And we are parked there at the RV bus parking area. Okay, here's the plan. There is a Walmart nearby at a town called Horizon City. I have to backtrack about mm, 10 miles, not the end of the world. And then the idea is to drive to San Antonio tomorrow and maybe spend a day there. But mm, my plans are about to change. Anyways, here we are at the Walmart. Turn left toward Horizon Boulevard, then turn right. Well, uh, out of all the places I've ever stayed overnight, tonight for the first time, I feel uncomfortable at this place, so I'm leaving. This is the, the Walmart at Horizon Ziri. Uh, turn right toward Horizon Boulevard, then turn left onto Horizon Boulevard. This is the Walmart at Horizon City in Texas. Uh, turn left onto Horizon Boulevard. It's, uh, it's just uh, east of El Paso. It is a very busy uh, shopping uh, area. It is Friday night, and uh, there were a bunch, bunch of youngsters jumping off my rear bumper. I mean, so I think I'm gonna stay at a rest area on, on I-10. I, I brew me some coffee. It's still relatively early, it's 8:30. I can drive for a couple more nights on on I-10 and, and look for a better place. I drive, late into the night, finding all the rest areas filled to capacity with semi-trucks. So eventually, I end up at the pilot in Van Horn. I wake up at 6 a.m., now in the central time zone, so I've lost one hour. The sunrise, still about an hour away. Hey, look, there was an RV park. The crack of dawn is starting to crack. There's that faint bluish glow on the horizon, indicating it is going to be daybreak soon. Now even more visible. And uh, check out the moon. I think I'm losing my mind.
make a short story even shorter. Uh, as I told you last night, I left uh, that Walmart uh, in the eastern out outskirts of El Paso. I didn't, it's not that I felt unsafe, but I didn't feel comfortable. It was uh, it was not quiet. There were a bunch of youngsters, you know, partying, and even some some kids that started jumping on my on my rear bumper. So you know. So I decided to to leave, and I, and, I, and I was hoping to find a. Uh, one of these rest areas or picnic areas uh, along the road, but they were all, all you know, f already full by that time. It was 9.30 ish. All, you know, all truckers. Uh, uh, late at night, uh, all these rest areas are insufficient uh, compared to the large amount of, of, of truckers in the area. So I drove around 90 miles to, to Van Horn and, and I st stayed at the, at the pilot uh, truck stop. I arrived around 11 p.m., but actually it was midnight because uh, I, I changed into central time zone now. So I slept about six hours. I put my alarm clock for, for 6 a.m. And uh, around 6.30, it was still nighttime. I left, it is now 7.30, so I've been driving for about an hour. And um, it's gonna be a beautiful sunrise. And it's actually, everything works out because now I expect to, to get to San Antonio today and not tomorrow. So, uh, I, I maybe a day earlier than usual. I mean, than expected. So I put my home address into the GPS and it says it's gonna take me one day and one hour to get home. So, um, if I were to drive non-stop, I didn't have to put gas, I didn't have to eat or, or go to the bathroom, I would arrive tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. in Miami, Florida. Of course, it's gonna take a lot longer than that. And check out, the sunrise is about to happen. All of a sudden, a drastic climate change as we start driving into this thick fog. Guess we're not in the desert anymore. Well, this is actually the bad weather I was trying to avoid, the reason I changed my travel plans back in Albuquerque. Better to tackle the storm down here in the south than up in Oklahoma or Kansas where they were forecasting snow and slit and all kinds of crazy weather. Pretty foggy out here. Let's continue. It's too early. Exactly where I put gas, uh, what about two weeks ago? Well, I'm hungry. Let's make some breakfast. Well, here we're cooking some quick breakfast on the road. Some uh, some spinach and, uh, and mushrooms here. And uh, some eggs, scrambling. We'll see how this comes out. We'll add a little bit of Paprika here. Oops, too much paprika. Doesn't matter. I love paprika. And salt, pepper. Mm, there we go. Spinach and mushrooms. And very soon we're gonna put the eggs in there. There we go. Put an egg on it or two. I was able to flip it over. Now is that pretty or what? <laughs> Yeah. 
It is, for the most part, a long and boring drive, and the grey gloomy weather certainly doesn't help matters. But some areas? Whew, some areas are absolutely breathtaking. Let's exit here by Sonora, Texas, put gas. The GPS has decided to take me through the middle of town, so let's do that. I can certainly use a change of scenery. Even the most beautiful landscapes can become tedious after so many hours on the road. Now passing by Junction, where they have the park that offers three nights of free camping. Riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. Here's the scenic view. I guess. That scenic view wasn't so scenic after all. I'm really tired. I started driving at 6.30 a.m. and it is now 1.30 p.m. One more hour to go. Riding, riding, oh, riding in my, my RV. We're getting close here, We're getting kind of close, approaching the Texas Hill Country. Well, here we are, we have arrived in San Antonio. And we have a few hours here until sundown, so let's take advantage of them as much as possible. First, let's go to the campground and unhitch. From Florida to Tennessee, my RV, wherever I want to be, cause I'm free in my RV, riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, cause I'm free in my RV. Well, not the greatest weather, but at least it's not raining. This is where I'm staying at here, at the San Antonio KOA. Let's head to downtown. We've only got a few hours here, so let's just check off the highlights. Luckily, the KOA is very centrally located, just a few miles away from downtown. Here's a public parking. I don't think it is the cheapest at a $15 flat rate, but here we are, right next to the Alamo, so let's explore. Well, finally made it to San Antonio. I think the Alamo must be somewhere back there. Yep, a short walk away and here we are. Oh yeah, everybody said it would look uh, disappointingly small. It does. Make a short line here and then we go in. Oh, by the way, photography inside, not allowed. 
Mm -mm. They watch you like hawks. They don't let you take any pictures inside, so... But I'm assuming out here is fine, right? Here we have some signs depicting the history of the Alamo. And back here, the grounds, they are really nice. It is kind of a bummer, it is such a cloudy day. I wonder if these stands here are part of some kind of reenactment. Well, in any case, it is a nice area to walk around, admiring all these oak trees. And I must admit, I am kind of lost, can't seem to find the exit. By the way, you exit through the museum slash gift shop. We're out. Uh, well, we'll continue. We'll continue exploring. Let's see where the river walk is and I have a couple more places that I want to show you. For now, well, that's all I could show you of the Alamo. Here's a monument bearing the names of those who died in the legendary Battle of the Alamo. So many tourists. This lively street is Alamo Plaza and we get, you know, antique cars and horse-drawn carriages. Uh, definitely a very touristy area. Ooh, and bicycles too. All modes of transportation. This uh, down here is an extension of the river walk. It is called Paseo del Alamo. And there's a beard garden. And what do we have here? The Cinderella's chariot. So it has a little bit of that old city character, which is really cool. Especially this area. Check it out. You see that big horn on the corner of that building? That's where we're going. Uh, that is the Bockhorn Saloon, established in 1881. And there is a museum with a collection of animals, uh, but I'm just going to the bar. Uh, back in the day, the original owner had the brilliant idea of accepting horns and antlers as payment when the patrons didn't have cash. And the rest is history. By the way, the beer is way larger than I expected. This is the original cherry wood and marble back bar. And lots, I mean, lots of dead animals on the walls. That was a pretty cool bar. Let's continue, wandering around downtown a little bit. Uh-oh, they found me. <laughs> yeah. This here is the Majestic Theater. I continue wandering, admiring the different architectural styles. Well, there's the river walk, but let's explore a little more before going to the river walk. There's the historic San Fernando Cathedral in the distance. Let's go down into the river walk. And this is the beginning, I guess. Not too lively around here. One of the main activities here is, of course, taking these boats that cruise up and down the river. Here we are, by the way, one story beneath the streets of San Antonio, in this network of walkways along the banks of the San Antonio River, as you will soon see, lined up with shops, bars, restaurants, public artwork. 
This idea originated after a very bad flood in 1921, and so they developed this flood control system that involved a floodgate, a dam, a bypass canal, so they could actually regulate the flow of water. And as a result, you know, prevent any future floods. Uh, by 1946, this flood control system actually proved to be very effective. The Casa Rio restaurant opened its doors. And the rest, the rest is history. It has been so successful that they keep expanding it and expanding it. Uh, like on that area we saw earlier by the Alamo, with the beer garden. Of course, we are here during Mardi Gras weekend, so some of the boats are decorated as floating floats. And there are some people in costume, and there is a very festive atmosphere all around. They even have masks decorating the bridges. Unfortunately, I think all the Mardi Gras related activities were during the day, so we missed them. Well, of course, you have to have mariachis at a place like this, right? I think I hear live music. Hmm, there's an audience. And I think the concert just ended. There. Here's some street art for you. And some Mardi Gras floats. This one's floating for real. It is all very lively and kind of crowded actually. Uh, many of the restaurants have a long waiting time, uh, so I'm gonna call it a night and start heading back. Although, let me tell you, Casa Rio sounded really tempting. This monument here is called La Antorcha de la Amistad. Spanish for the Torch of Friendship, a gift from the Mexican government to the city of San Antonio back in 2002. The sculpture seems to look kind of different depending from where you look at it. And the sculptor says that that is how he sees the two nations' relationship. Sometimes it is harmonious, sometimes it's complicated. El Presidente. And that is the end of our two, two and a half, three hours here in San Antonio, Texas. Very cool city. I do want to return with more time and, and explore a lot more beyond the river walk, beyond the Alamo uh, and all that. But uh, for now, this is it. I don't have to tell you I'm very, very tired. I've been driving most of the day, so I'm going back to the RV and uh, see you on the road. Cool to see all the carriages illuminated at night. Yeah, next time we definitely have to go up there. That, by the way, was the Tower of the Americas, which has an observation deck and a restaurant. Hello there.
Good morning from the San Antonio KOA. It is kind of cold. It's drizzling a little bit. But you know what? After two weeks in the desert, I find this kind of weather kind of neat, actually. <laughs> mm, there's humidity again. <laughs> well, they have a breakfast place here at the campground, so I'm gonna check that out. And then uh, dump propane and off we go to the east. It is actually colder than I expected. I'm just gonna leave. I'm not really that hungry yet, and uh, I can have something on the road in a couple hours. You know, take a break. So, uh, off we go. I'm getting some Texas water for the road. Yes, it feels so incredibly cold this morning here in mid-February. It is probably in the 30s, but it feels like mid-20s with the high humidity and the wind chill. Well, first things first, let's pay a visit to the dump station. I'm also gonna get some propane. One of my tanks got depleted last night. San Antonio. Well, it's gonna be a nasty drive today. It is cloudy, as you see. It is kind of it's windy, but anyways. I didn't stay there long enough to give you like a thorough review of the campground. It seemed fine. I got a, only a water and electric site because only for one night, you know, I did dump my gray water. I got propane. It is 8.30 in the morning here at Central Time. The goal is Biloxi, Mississippi, but I don't guarantee we're going to make it there. We'll try though. Oh, by the way, you know I'm from South Florida, so uh, I'm kind of ignorant about cold weather issues. But I just realized, 40 degrees in Texas in, in, with humidity and wind, it's not at all like 40 degrees in Arizona with dry air and no wind. It's incredibly cold here this morning. It's actually 36 degrees. No wonder it feels so cold. Yeah. And now weather on the ground says 34. And it feels like 28. No wonder. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, 7 mile per hour winds coming from the west. Which is actually good tailwinds. Uh, it might be good uh, once I'm on the, on the open road. And 20% uh, chance of precipitation today. Well, there's our 20% precipitation. Don't you wish the odds worked like that at the casino? In a quarter mile, merge onto I-10 East. Uh, well, it is kind of windy out there, so it, it does make for a stressful drive. Let's make breakfast. Did I mention it's cold? <sighs> yeah, much better. Well, we're gonna make some um, uh, pancakes. And these are uh, delicious whole grain pancakes. I got this milk that I bought back in, I think it was in, in Phoenix. And I think all I need is an egg and some oil. Half cup.
we're a little off level here. That could be a, a bad thing, but we'll banish it. Not the best turn I've ever done, but it's not bad. Well, this one came out much better. Well, bon appetit, eh? I think this is the coldest it's felt throughout the whole trip, the whole month I've been on the road. Oh my, it's really, really nasty out there. Let's continue. So many flags. Anyways, uh, here we are, approaching Houston. definitely have to visit Houston one of these days. But today I'm on a mission here, Florida or bust. I am thinking Florida by tomorrow, South Florida by the day after. Yeah, Houston is the city that never ends. I mean, I've been driving through Houston for what feels like forever. Luckily, it is a Sunday at 12.30, so there's not a whole lot of traffic, so that's good. I know Texas is long. I'm almost done with Texas, but... It is a long, large, huge state. Crossing the San Jacinto River. And there's Bucky's, that humongous gas station and convenience store. It is true, everything is bigger in Texas. Louisiana. We did it! Crossed the entire state of Texas once again, a feat only comparable to crossing the whole state of Florida. To put it in perspective, a cross in Texas here through I-10 has been about 875 miles. From Pensacola by the Florida-Alabama state line to my home in South Florida is about 700. Not that big a difference in the great scheme of things. We are once again here at Bro Bridge. If you recall, I spent the night at this Walmart here on the way west. And I am very tempted to stay because I'm starting to get tired. But I'm determined to continue pushing through. I'm just gonna take a break and continue. Well, let's make one Americano for the last leg of the trip. Head southwest toward Reese Street. Well, I took a little bit of a break here at the, at the Walmart. It's a slowdown on I-10 East near Baton Rouge that is causing a 17-minute delay. Ouch. You should reach your destination by 8.46 p.m. Okay, maybe by the time I get there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, here I'm at Broad Bridge in the Louisiana and uh, off we go. Uh, about three more hours. Oh yeah, this is the, the pilot that has a casino. Next, we're gonna cross the Atchafalaya Basin, which, cool fact, is the largest wetland and swamp in the United States. On the way west, I crossed it at night, and it's not like I'm doing much better today, but at least we can see something. City lights of Baton Rouge illuminate the skies. Here at Louisiana's capital, once again, I cross the Mississippi River. I drive to the dark, stormy night. By 9 p.m., although it might as well be 2 a.m., I'm so tired, I arrive in Mississippi, and I go into the Welcome Center, and there are no overnight parking signs everywhere. So when the security guard came, I thought he was going to kick me out, but he just told me to park in this other area, away from the semi-trucks, and check it out! It is almost like a pull-through site at a campground, sans hookups. Anyways, good night. Good morning. 
Well, I slept here at the Mississippi uh, Welcome Center rest area. In theory, it says no overnight parking, but I guess they just want to deter people from camping here indefinitely, so they, they don't really uh, mind. You know, the security guard just told me to park by this area, you know, and, and leave that other area over there for the, for the trucks, which is fine with me. Well, the idea today is to make it uh, to the east coast of Florida, to the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, that way we would uh, complete our coast to coast road trip back and forth. So let's hydrate and hit the road. It is another gloomy day here with a non stop drizzle. Here to the right is the Infinity Science Center. And there's even a lunar lander exhibit right here at the rest area, which I didn't see, of course, I didn't know it was there. And all that is because we are right next to the Stennis Space Center, NASA's largest rocket testing facility. Too bad I'm on a mission here because it would have been great to visit. This morning, I am taking a little bit of a scenic ride here, towards a golf port and Biloxi, because I want to see the Gulf of Mexico here in Mississippi. But as you can see, the weather is not quite cooperating this morning. Would this count as driving coast to coast? Well, if it doesn't, we'll be in Florida soon enough. Well, here we are. It's uh, not the best weather, but we've made it to the Gulf of Mexico. Well, not exactly a perfect uh, beach weather by any means, but uh, we are made it to the Gulf Coast. Amazing to think that just a few days ago, I was, the, I was in a different ocean. You know, back in the in the Pacific. And now I'm here just a days away from the Atlantic. That sure looks like hurricane damage. Hurricane Nate in 2017 perhaps. Alright, let's continue our journey. It's kind of chilly this morning. Check out all these mansions here, and they are almost, I mean, almost oceanfront. Or golf front, waterfront, I guess, in any case. There's also a famous oak tree somewhere around here uh, called the Friendship Oak. I wonder if there are any RV parking restrictions. Do you see any signs for no overnight parking? I don't. I mean, I'll have to look up the city ordinances, but. Uh, I bet you, you could boondock here for the night and nobody would bother you. Yep, more research shall go into this because I would love to wake up next to the Gulf of Mexico, right here. Maybe not with Minitini, but if at some point we can get something a little more stealth, hmm, yep, for sure. We are approaching Biloxi, and I'm going to turn around right here because I spotted a historical landmark, I saw a brown sign on the road, and here it is, Beauvoir, Jefferson Davis's home, you know, the former Confederate president. Not a whole lot to see from the outside, so instead, uh, I'm going to make another U-turn here and have breakfast with a view. It's going to be breakfast with a view, I'm making pancakes. The only bad thing about this site is that, my site, sorry, I'm, I'm parked here in the middle of the street, let me show you. Is that sometimes there's a lot of traffic uh, coming through here on the, yeah, I'm gonna call it pancakes by the sea. Well, this is a lot of fun, but if I don't get off this scenic route, I am never, I mean, never going to make it, so uh, we're going to rejoin I-10 here in Biloxi. Yeah. 
Here to the right is the luxurious Beau Rivage Resort and Casino. The Hard Rock, a little further down. Some of these casinos allow overnight parking, so at one point, the plan was to overnight right here. Well, time to take the faster route. Florida awaits. I'm riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free. In my RV, yeah, I'm riding. Welcome to Alabama. Sweet home, Alabama. Sweet wet, Alabama. Because I'm free in my RV, yeah. Because I'm free in my RV, yeah, riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Welcome to Florida. Because I'm free. Well, we are in Florida. Only 716 miles to go. Oh gosh, I am so tired I sound like I'm drunk. Now, crossing is Cambria Bay in Pensacola. We get stuck in traffic near Destin. The rolling hills near Tallahassee. The problem with Florida is that, for the most part, it all looks about the same, particularly from the highway. As the day comes to an end, I am going to stop for the night at this rest area in the Osceola National Forest, somewhere between Lake City and Jacksonville. I'm riding. Nah, not riding anymore, I'm tired. Well, good morning. I want to go home now. Ninety-five South, we are on the home stretch now, and the sun even wants to peek out. I need to make one last dump, so I'm going to stop here at the Sunshine Travel RV Resort in Vero Beach. It is ten dollars to use the dump station, and it is one of the cleanest ones I've seen. I'm making the final dump.
Well, hello, good morning and greetings from Miami Beach. I thought it would be a, a fitting ending to our coast-to-coast -coast, uh, journey to end it right here at sunrise from Miami Beach on the East Coast. I really hope you have enjoyed uh, this video and go check it out. Pelican! Fly, Pelican! <laughs> Riding with my RV Wherever I want to be Cause I'm free in my RV 